get started as people are joining us today. We're very grateful to have with us Daniel Pinchbeck. He is a noted author and, um, and political influencer. I would um, suggest a great person to follow in terms of his inquisitive uh, Gemini mind. But um, very creative individual who's um, done a lot to explore the field of psychedelics and culture as it applies to, um, to us here in Western culture. I would ask that you mute your uh, microphone so that we can hear Daniel speak today. And Daniel had recently um, gone through some experiences of researching and talking about COVID or talking about the politics of COVID. And um, we know from Jim Cramer that uh, right now is the largest transfer of wealth ever in the history of, um, of human history as we know it. And so um, we know that COVID and the, the time of COVID and the disease and, and the vaccines and all of these uh, issues are, uh, are important topics, are serious topics. And we, we want people to be able to discuss them in respectful ways, but we, we want people to be able to discuss them in uncensored ways. Um, and so what had happened recently that uh, Daniel experienced was that he had written about the subject um, and had experienced some pushback and, and had been censored on Facebook. Um, and so what that brought about was an opportunity to ask him to spend some time having discussions with us uh, in the NPO and Seattle Psychedelic Society community regarding you know, what, what are the concerns as we look at money and the power of money in the, uh, the modern day world of, of who controls the media and what gets explored and what gets talked about. So we're here today to have a respectful discussion and we're looking for, um, for Daniel to talk a little bit about, about what led him to you know, have some of the concerns that he wrote about in his initial piece on Facebook that got censored. But then also to ask that people write their questions um, in the chat or also just speak up, um, but to engage with Daniel in a conversational pattern so that we are able to converse about this and have a, and have a good discussion um, here today. So let's welcome Daniel. Yeah, thanks so much for, uh, for having me. And I think it's great that you're um, sort of expanding the parameters of the uh, you know, Psychedelic Society or the Entheos Society to um, talk about these other topics. Um, and I mean, yeah, so um, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, as a thinker, I'm kind of like a generalist. So, you know, I allow myself to think and write about many different topics. As you mentioned, my first book was on uh, psychedelics. I was uh, Breaking Open the Head. It came out in 2002. I wrote a book about prophecies, uh, 2012, Return of Quetzalcoatl. Uh, I wrote a book around um, kind of thinking through, you know, kind of systemic responses to the um, ecological crisis. So it's a book called How Soon Is Now? Uh, and um, also wrote a book uh, with an anthropologist, Sophia Rocklin, about uh, kind of ayahuasca, uh, its history, and, and kind of, you know, almost, almost like a biography of ayahuasca that came out recently. And um, yeah, like with everybody else, as this whole pandemic started, I started brooding about it and wondering what the hell was going on, and um, kind of wrote one book maybe a year ago called Conspiranoia, just a short essay book that I published on um uh it was on amazon self-published and um yeah and that and that i was already starting to think about because it seemed it seemed very obvious that the virus was um to me anyway it was engineered in a lab um it seems that um you know Wuhan was where this uh, somebody's not muted um if they can mute themselves it'd sound better um it, yeah so so um the wuhan had this one laboratory where the main researcher was taking coronaviruses from bats and doing gain-of-function research to make them more communicable to humans. And so it seemed very obvious that that was likely the source of, of, the, of the virus. Then as I, I studied it and I wrote about it in Conspiranoia, I also learned that um, the Chinese military had a huge program studying, um, kind of, you know, turning uh, viruses to bioweapons. Like they were, they were basically seeing biowarfare as like the next theater of war. And they were also talking about um, kind of um, engineered kind of mind control um, through uh, injections and so on. And um, in Wuhan, there was also the strange sort of other theme around this guy, Charles Lieber, um, who was a Harvard uh, chemist, nanotechnologist, who had set up a um, illegal lab there. Um, and you, you can look it up. And he, he was doing something, working on something called NeuroLace, I think, which is 
injectable nanotechnology which can coat the brainstem and actually control your behavior on, on like that type of like brainstem level. So I found that like very, very spooky also. And, you know, so, so I started writing about it and thinking about it and then also trying to understand, you know, a little bit about, um, you know, Bill Gates and the vaccines. I mean, he's a huge figure of uh, controversy. You know, many people think that he's a humanitarian. Uh, many people are more suspicious of what his motivations are. I don't even understand exactly what his motivations are. Um, you know, I, I don't think that he is, you know, some kind of evil genius who's consciously seeking to, you know, to populate the world. But he is, you know, a super capitalist uh, control freak. And, um, you know, he I mean, I think it's almost maybe subliminal or unconscious on his part, because first he made you know, his fortune by uh, controlling the operating system of the Internet. And now, in a way, he's working on controlling the biological operating system uh, through this whole you know, vaccine program. So, yeah, then like everybody tracking, you know, the, the, the virus. I mean, I've been living in um, Tulum in Mexico. You know, I've obviously known many, many people who've gotten it. Um, you know, the vast majority of people I know who got it here had minor cases. Uh, I've known a couple of much older people who've died. Um, you know, I know a couple of younger people who had complications from it. Um, but I've kind of, you know, been a little bit more on the, I mean, I think one thing that's so interesting right now is all of our, um, kind of like, you know, kind of uh, typical uh, dichotomies, like left, right, liberal, conservative, and so on, are kind of being swiveled around and, and, and you know, made much more ambiguous and complex. Uh, I always identify as, you know, more of a leftist. Uh, well, not really a liberal, I suppose. But yeah, I've been, I've been very, um, I, I guess in a way, I, I found myself very suspicious around um, the amount of uh, sort of technocratic force that's been uh, being exerted on, you know, sort of uncontrolling populations as a result, of, a result of this virus, you know, when, you know, while it is obviously a bad virus and, and has these effects, um, you know, it, many things are very confusing about it um, in terms of like the, you know, WHO originally said that, there were, you know, 70 percent of the population were going to get it no matter what, uh, that the whole point of, you know, the masking and social distancing was just to kind of... Um, uh, give us time so that, that hospitals didn't get filled up. Uh, but then, you know, when the, you know, the rates of hospitals getting filled up, you know, in general was a lot less than anticipated, they, they sort of doubled down. These measures. And, um, okay. you know, sorry about that. Hey, no worries. Uh, and then looking into you know, all the stuff around, you know, I mean, the World Economic Forum, what will be set, and how this, um, whoever's not muted, uh, how this, CW, um, uh, you know, this fits perfectly into kind of um, an agenda uh, that allows for yeah a lot of a lot of control of the population on, on many on many levels, um, and um, so yeah and then and then you know extending that in, in terms of what's happened with vaccines I mean you know, I, I have to be honest that the anecdotal reports that I'm getting from people maybe today. Uh, you know, somebody that, you know, told me that, you know, they knew somebody who died a few days after getting the vaccine and it was a healthy person, 60 years old. You know, I, I'm hearing anecdotal reports of people dying, you know, soon after getting the vaccine, uh, you know, who were otherwise healthy. A number of them, a number of people saying anecdotally that, uh, yeah, they, they, the vaccine seems more dangerous, you know, what they're, what they're seeing in their world around them than the virus itself. And uh, the virus is obviously being mandated to young people who have like very low um, risk so far from you know, complications with coronavirus because they get it. Um, and you know, there's a number of journalists who've been more suspicious around what's been happening. And intellectuals they've obviously been marginalized or you know sometimes censored. Uh, Alex Berenson is one. Uh, he wrote a four-part part series um, about uh, the virus. He was actually a New York Times, Harvard-educated New York Times journalist who was covering the pharmaceutical uh, industry. So, you know, clearly he would have, you know, a lot of, a lot of you know, good knowledge and perspective to be looking at this. Um, you know, then, again, then more on the radical fringe, you have um, Chris Martin from Peak Prosperity um, uh, doing very interesting videos. Um, and then you have a couple of whistleblowers uh, from the pharmaceutical industry who, 
you know, it's, it's, it's very complex stuff. But one is Michael Needham. Uh, uh, another one I think is called um, Geert uh, Vandenbosch. Um, then you have a very extensive um, research effort by the, the somewhat manic uh, and sometimes over the top Jim Corbett of Corbett Report, who uh, also takes a lot of uh, effort going through all the different scientific research papers um, um, leading up to the release of the vaccine and after, which suggests that it might have you know, other things um, involved with it, um, you know, other, other purposes, other agendas. So yeah, so I, I can't say that I know, you know anything for sure um, you know, I'm, I'm noticing that, you know, my community is very split between those who are, you know, you know, accepting the vaccine or who believe the vaccine is a positive step and those who are feeling uh, resistant to it, seeing it as a, um, you know, still experimental procedure, or kind of kind of um, kind of heavy handed intervention. I mean, I, you know, I think, um, uh, of course, you know, for people who are at risk, who have, you know, low immune systems or are old and, and you know, immune compromised, you know, the vaccine is definitely a boon as those people are in great danger. Um, you know, other than that, I feel that, you know, what's happening with it, the, the heavy handed application of it has a lot to do with kind of um, the integration, let's say, of biotech, uh, tech companies, media companies, finance companies and, and governments. Um, you know, Pfizer is going to make $26 billion this year as a result of the vaccine. Uh, Moderna has been trying to foist uh, these kind of mRNA um, you know, um, vaccines has been trying to you know create create a mar market for them that's been failing uh, until now. Um, I heard I was lucky enough to hear the CEO of Moderna speaking on Clubhouse just a bit, and and once again the way he was speaking, um, you know, to me, I, I just feel uneasy. Um, he was talking about um, you know mRNA as the software of life and talking about vaccines as platforms. So it's a very uh, mechanistic. Uh, you know, technologist, you know, en you know, engineering approach to, you know, the, 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 the human, you know, biome, the, 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 you know, and, and, and the ecological biosphere. And this is also happening while the, um, you know, genetic engineering is accelerating. Like we just saw, you know, genetically engineered mosquitoes released in Florida into the wild. Um, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, the world is already so out of balance. And uh, yeah, it just, it just feels that, um, you know, all, all these interventions are going to make it more out of balance. And, you know, then there are questions um, like this guy, Geert Vandenbosch, is concerned that, um, you know, the, the, the vaccines themselves will be the cause of uh, new variants. Um, and but those new variants are probably going to be back blamed on the unvaccinated uh, because it all goes along with the same narrative of wanting to kind of... Um, uh, you know, force people into the situation where we're basically at the mercy of, you know, corporations and governments who will have, you know, biometric IDs. They'll be choosing, you know, what booster shots we have to take every, you know, three months, six months or a year. Um, you know, there's just seems like there's a lot of smoke and mirrors here. And, um, you know, definitely Alex Berenson is interesting to follow on Twitter. I mean, he looks a lot of the data around, you know, kind of, um, you know, reinfections, deaths, um, uh, heart disease, you know, problems in young people after the vaccinations. So, yeah, I'm not really saying that I have any, like, you know, tremendous, I don't have like an answer here, but um, the, the whole thing definitely has me um, feeling that something is, is, is off. And, you know, I, I can take that in, in that it's just a, a legacy systems that are self-organizing and doing what they do to enhance their own power. You know, or a level deeper, one, one can wonder if, if there are more conspiratorial agendas uh, in, ter in terms of a uh, control system or, you know, e even darker things. Um, so, yeah, so those are some of my kind of ideas around it. And I'm happy to take questions or have a little back and forth if somebody wants to, wants to jump in. Morgan, do you do you want to encourage folks to either ask questions directly or, or post them in the chat? Why don't they post them in the in the chat first? Or just say they have a question, and then and then they can pull, we can pull them up if that works. Okay. Uh, and Leo, maybe you want to start. Like, what were some of your thoughts about Is this? Is there any chance the volume could get turned up? My volume? Yeah. My volume is all the way up. Really, really difficult time hearing. Shits. Um. So one one of my questions was today I you know I listen to news sources all across the spectrum um, 
and I, I just love diversity. I love uh, in Entheo, we try to have people from all walks of life so that we're not, uh, we're just encouraging of everyone um, and trying to accept everyone from you know their perspective. I've seen so much uh, division during this time of COVID um, between people who, do, who don't want vaccines and people who do um, and, and feel like it's a, uh, it's a matter of life and death, you know? And, um, and so I, I feel like there's so much division right now. I think that's break, uh, breaking my heart to see within the psychedelic community um, and just within, you know, our communities in general. But anyway, I, today I saw two different things. One I saw on uh, Fox News, there was the scientist, the, the wife, uh, she, was, she was coming from Wuhan and she had disclosed that Wuhan had done some shady stuff and was talking about all of that stuff and saying her life was in danger and that her husband had tried to poison her in China and that the Chinese government didn't want uh, it disclosed that they were nailing people into, you know, buildings and hiding, you know, certain things of maybe spreading this as bio warfare and, you know, nefarious activity. Um, and I just struggle sometimes with why people can't conceptualize that some that a virus can be very real, but also that there may be um, nefarious activity in the world from the people who want to control people and. And I find that sometimes people can't somehow hold both. Um, and then the other piece of news I saw today that really made my heart break was I have spent a, a fair amount of time in Hong Kong. I have um, family members that are Chinese and I have been to Hong Kong and seen the democracy there that's not available throughout the rest of China. And this was an article in, in the mainstream, it was through CNN. It was talking about during COVID how they've gone in and taken away the rights of the Hong Kong people under the auspices of COVID. Um, and so I guess my question is, where do you sit with trying to find a, a place of camaraderie when you, you're you trying to unite people? How, how do you, how, what tools do you use to try to unite people who come from very diverse perspectives on this issue so that everyone feels heard and does not feel censored and and how do you deal with being censored on platforms like facebook where they are legitimately removing your posts um and and what you know platforms do you find like a safe place to not be censored i guess before i start uh i mean i guess i mean i'm a little bit pessimistic you know in in my feelings about about the world at the moment. I mean, we were just talking about the heat wave in uh, Seattle. Uh, I mean, I wrote this book, uh, How Soon Is Now, uh, that came out in 2017. And that was like a 10 year effort to you know, think through the implications of the ecological emergency. And, um, you know, it's clear that we're not in any way moving, um, you know, mobilizing to address this um, situation. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I don't even know to what, and you know, it, it seems like there's just increasing fragmentation. Um, I mean, you know, in, in a way, uh, many years ago, I started a, a group called Evolver. It was a company and nonprofit. We had local, you know, offshoots and that was kind of my best idea for, for unifying is to get people together in, in face to face, uh, community gatherings so they can, you know, talk to each other and learn together. Uh, but, you know, in a place like America, it's very difficult because everybody's just like forced into the you know, survival rat race by the financial system, you know, which is, you know, basically a very destructive instrument. So it's like, you know, the whole system seems to be working together, um, you know, and um, it's, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily seem like it's, it's working in the right direction. I, so I don't really know how, how we unify people at this point. And, um, you know, I, I mean, in, in some ways, yeah, I mean, I do feel that like, under, you know, and I don't really believe in these presidential, you know, politics so much, but I mean, I, I you know, I do feel to some extent, um, you know, the, the liberal tendency with Obama, you know, it was, and so on was sort of appeased China. Uh, and, and actually now it really is looking that China is like, is like a tremendous villain. Um, and, you know, we don't really want to deal with what that, you know, means. I mean, but it's also, 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, so, somehow it, it seems that, you know, psychopaths rise to the top in these, um, you know, authoritarian power structures. And, um, you know, so if you have countries that are ruled by psychopaths, you know, they'll, they'll do things like, you know, create bioweapons and then, you know, accidentally release them to see what happens. Uh, you know, what, what I think happened in, in Wuhan it could have been intentionally released or it may have accidentally been released, but then it looks like they let it, uh, they, they even forced it um, gave it time to go around the world because for a while China locked down its domestic <coughs> airlines, but but they still um, insisted that other countries take uh, passengers from from that area. So they 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 were they they were like, okay, the cat cat's out of the bag. Let's see what happens when this thing goes around the world. And and you know maybe they had even run, you know, kind of like you know tests like you know there was the event twenty one that it was run in the U S where they kind of knew that they would be able to handle the uh, you know economic. And social impacts of, of this virus, you know, better than the West did, uh, you know, which is which is what kind of happened. Um, okay, so somebody had a question. I think Nathan, or sorry, um, uh, the first one. Maybe, maybe Leo, you can keep track of questions. But I think Miguel said James has a question. So maybe James, you want to jump up first? Hi, Daniel. Um, nice to meet you. Uh, in a sense, so. Back in 2010, I started reading the 2012 book that you had written and participated in. And recently I had a conversation with a friend regarding that it's 2021. And so there's like this correlation between 2012 and 2021. And I can speak a lot about that, just some thoughts that I've had about that, but I don't need to go there. I think what I've noticed is we had, I'm also an astrologer, and we had the great Capricorn conjunction last year, right at the pandemic, and we having, we're seeing all of this upheaval, and it almost seems like the world is actually forking, or that 3D and the 4D is changing in a sense. I know that's a little bit more mystical and esoteric, but it's starting to become more apparent about that fork between technocratic societies and human societies. So I'm curious if now you were to take a look at yourself as it's 2021 and compare that to 2012, what you would be able to extrapolate from your writings and what's going on today? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, James, I've been following obviously a lot along with that. I mean, um, I um, have been super fascinated by this work. I just posted him, uh, Sergio Magana. Uh, who is a um, uh, Toltec uh, shaman. Uh, he wrote a book called either The Age of the Sixth Sun or The Dawn of the Sixth Sun. Uh, and in that book, he said that from the uh, Aztec uh, or Nahuatl perspective, it's uh, 2012 to 2021 was actually the transition from the fifth sun to the sixth sun. So yeah, now, now we're totally in the sixth sun. Now for uh, Magana, he talks about um, the last you know 6,000 year, whatever, according to the Aztecs or whatever, uh, eight, you know, the fifth sun was the sun of light, and the sixth sun that we've now entered into on, I think, May 26th even, uh, he calls the sun of darkness. Uh, and what this means, it's like a polarity shift from a focus on, like, sort of the daylight aspects of consciousness, like rational empiricism, waking, uh, you know, sort of masculine, you know, kind of scientific, um, uh, and so on, to more like the, the night side of consciousness, the psyche, the dream world, um, you know, vision, intuition. Uh, and that, you know, he said that, you know, according to him and what he and apparently he's speaking for his lineage is, um, yeah, we're, we're moving into a time where reality becomes more and more like uh, kind of like a waking dream. Uh, and, you know, it does feel like that's happening, like things are very ambiguous. Um, you know, we're in a time when, you know, deep fakes and fake news and, you know, it's, it's very hard to, you know, figure out what's what's authentic. Um, so, yeah, I, mean, I, I do kind of feel that um, that we're, we're in that um, transformation time still. Yeah. Can somebody uh, mute themselves who's unmuted? Please mute yourself or Dan, do you mind muting folks? Um, so is there, is there, um, what's the next question? Is there a, a question that appeals to you or do you want us to just scroll up to the top of the chat? If you can just scroll up. I can't, I can't really chat. Okay. I, I'm just, I'm just going to read a couple of these to you. Have you lost friends or had backlash for questioning the narrative? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I have a lot of, I mean, not good friends. I mean, my good friends know that I'm, you know, independent, you know, weirdo and will think my own thoughts. But I've, you know, definitely lost kind of second tier acquaintances and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, you know, you know, I actually like years ago, I had, a, I was doing a podcast, a House of Now podcast. I interviewed Del Bigtree, uh, who um, made the movie Vaxxed. And um, I mean, I actually found some of his ideas around um, vaccines and ADHD and autism, you know, to be quite sensible. Uh, and back then I actually lost some friends just for, just for airing that. Um, and um, yeah, I, mean, I, I did an interview with RFK Jr. on his Instagram, uh, which got wiped off of Instagram. Uh, he lost his account there. Um, and yeah, so I, I've, I've lost some friends, but, 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 but no good friends. And I'm kind of used to it at this point. All right. Um, let's see here. It looks like the next one is, um, do you feel, okay. One topic is the MRNA, uh, inventor now being removed from his involvement historically revisionist, which I'm not sure. That was, that was fascinating. Okay. Robert Malone. They've been going in and changing, you know, like the um, Wikipedia and removing him from his role as the inventor of the mRNA. He was on like a The Dark Horse podcast. And I was thinking, you know, what are doing? I don't know if you can that. It's a little hard to hear you. Uh, what's the name of the guy? Uh, Robert Malone. Yeah. I, I, I haven't tracked that exactly. I mean, I know that um, there's been some backtracking. Um, I mean, um, once again, this guy, Chris Martin, on this Peak Prosperity podcast, I thought did some very good uh, research around uh, the Fauci emails and how they, they clearly uh, conspired to cover up the uh, lab leak uh, origin uh, because they knew that was going to reflect extremely uh, badly on them uh, and al also um, would, you know, potentially... Um, Kind of, you know, I mean, you know, basically the only thing that's holding our society together at this point, maybe, is, is the church of science. You know, the, the belief that science is, is a tool for progress and inherently good. Um, you know, so, so if that begins to crumble and we learn that, you know, these, these diseases are actually being, you know, created by the, by the you know, scientific, you know, community that, you know, says it's supposed to protect us. Um, you know, that, it, it's hard to see where society, you know, goes from there. So, so I can understand why they had a lot of fear around that becoming, um, you know, common knowledge or public knowledge, at least until they had time to, to figure out how to spin it in some way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I don't know enough about Robert Malone to, to, to say anything about it. Uh, what, what's, the, what's the reason why they're um, changing his uh, histor history? Because he's speaking like he's concerned about like the mass spread use of mRNA vaccine in the way it's being yeah. Yeah, that, that's where, I mean, I, I don't know if his reasons are the same as Geert uh, Vandenbosch, but yeah, I guess the idea, I mean, apparently, um, so I mean, um, yeah, there, there, you know, there had never been this type of vaccine in use like this. I mean, even with animal tests, one thing that they had was a problem called pathogenic priming, mm -hmm. uh, yep. which is where animals would, um, you know, have the virus, I mean, they would have the vaccine, that if they were reinfected with some strain of the virus, it would actually affect them much worse and be more likely to be fatal. Um, so apparently that, 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 is, that, is, that is a concern. I mean, yeah, the, the, I mean, this, max, this mass vaccination strategy, you know, to me seems kind of demented considering how, much, how little we know about, about these things. And I think it would have totally made sense to give people who were like immune compromised or anybody who felt, you know, that they needed this, but the way it's being, um, kind of coercively forced on the population. Well, uh, here they had a whole shot of a lifetime in you know, someone with a $250,000 check. Oh, yeah? Upcoming nurse was getting her vaccine. And they did the same thing in California, right, where they had a, you know, basically like a game show. I mean, at this point, there's been so much hyper-normalization. Yeah. You know, to where I think some of us that haven't been in that state of hyper-normalization are like, what the, you know, what the fuck? going on but for people i think that have been watching reality tv shows it's even it's even very very sophisticated people i, I recently had a debate with somebody who I, I felt was like a friend uh rob bresney who writes an astrology column for um you know sf weekly or something and um you know basically it reached the point in our discussion where he would not say that he didn't feel that people should just be forced to take this vaccine 
you know, so then he's like a, you know, liberal, well-meaning, you know, guy. So, so it's reached the point where, you know, for a whole strata of, of liberal society, uh, it, it, they, it, for me, it's, it's, it's approaches the kind of, you know, techno fascism. If you're, if you're going to force people to take uh, these types of shots against their will. Um, I don't even know what to say. It's, it's, I, can't, I can't even believe that it's gotten to this point so quickly. But yeah, as you say, the hyper-normalization, I mean, um, you know, I see it in, in my mother who watches, you know, too much, you know, television news. You know, it's just, um, you know, and, and, who, and who are the biggest, you know, advertisers and sponsors of, of television? It's the pharmaceutical companies, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. thank you. Yeah, of course. So the next question has to do with someone who was on a call today with Frontline COVID Critical Care Alliance doctors, and they had Ivory Hecker, who was the Fox whistleblower. It was all about the censorship of doctors and the real science and how to get the message out there that it sounds like other treatments are available um, that this person is speaking to. So I think in general, they're, they're speaking to the idea that doctors who have dissenting opinions are being censored or silenced. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, you know, I mean, first of all, it's insane that you know simple things like um, you know vitamins, you know, exercise, sunlight. I mean, all these things, you know, were never even discussed. I mean, the the, the medical uh, you know establishment has totally fallen behind these you know highly profitable you know experimental vaccines, and um, you know other, other treatments. Uh, that you know seem to be potentially very beneficial uh, are not even allowed to the discussion, particularly in the U.S. I mean, I'm, I'm in uh, Mexico, where I can get you know Invermectin uh, over the counter, you know, so that's considered a prophylactic, uh, and also you know reduces symptoms, you know, if you get it. But um, you know, apparently the WHO just did one study of Invermectin, but they gave you know massive, like over overly high doses to people, to, and, and and they were like, oh, it made them sick. Uh, but, you know, once again, I mean, yeah, what, what is so overwhelmed, like, you know, one is just trying to live one's little life and who has the time to read like every you know, science paper and, and go down every wormhole here. I mean, I think that guy, Chris Martin on Peak Prosperity uh, is pretty impressive uh, in terms of the amount of research that he's doing. Uh, and, you know, I've also kind of handed it to James Corbett, though I think he's a little bit on the paranoid edge, uh, you know, what he looks at in terms of. Uh, the vaccine science and, you know, what could be involved with these vaccines now or in the future, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's quite impressive what, what he finds, you know. Okay. So for folks that are just joining us, please add your questions to the chat. And then if I read them and you would like to follow up more with Daniel, feel free. Um, this, this person says, I think we need to, oh, and also mute yourself if you're not speaking. This person says, I think we need to give up the ghost, RE, making peace with those who drunk the Kool-Aid. A true resistance needs to come together to resist, not capsulate. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, that there's some, there's some, you know, that makes sense to me. Um, I just don't know in a society that's as, you know, you know, kind of broken and fragmented as what's happening in the U.S. right now, how we could come together. Um, you know, that's something I've been thinking about for years, frankly. And as I said, I started this nonprofit called the Evolver Social Movement, um, Evolver Network, where we, we were creating local groups. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, Zeitgeist was an interesting effort. Transition Town was an interesting effort. They, they never seem able to uh, scale. But, yeah, I mean, I mean we've totally lost the habit of creating kind of like, you know, community people power um, a, 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 as a way of, um, you know, sharing knowledge and, and, and um, kind of uh, resisting, I guess, in a way. Uh, I mean, in England, you know, in Europe, there's actually been, I think, more active uh, resistance, uh, although, of course, a lot of that doesn't get covered uh, by the media. But, um, you know, there's been a lot of big uh, marches and big gatherings. And I think actually, if you look at the stats, in Europe, for people, the, the amount of adults taking the vaccines, it's, it's much less than here, actually, although that's not really reported. Um, okay, well, that's, that's interesting. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 
on December 9th, 2019, before the outbreak of the pandemic became generally known, Daz Zak gave an interview in which he talked in glowing terms of how researchers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology had been reprogramming the spike protein and generating chimeric coronaviruses capable of infecting humanized mice. And we have found, now found, you know, after six or seven years of doing this, over 100 new SARS-related coronaviruses, very close to SARS. Dazik says around minute 28 of the interview. Some of them get into human cells in the lab. Some of them can cause SARS disease in humanized mice models and are untreatable with therapeutic monoclonals, and you can't vaccinate against them with a vaccine. So these are a clear and present danger. Now that a coronavirus pandemic has spread across the world, they're denying they were either involved, ever involved in that sort of undertaking. It, it sounds like it's more of a commentary. Yeah, I mean, I know what she's talking about. I think his name is Peter Daszak. Uh, he was, um, uh, I think he's kind of involved with the um, this Fauci cover up, the initial, the initial uh, call around that. And then, and then they rushed that, uh, our essay in Nature magazine, uh, six days later came out that said, or something that said that the, there's no way that this coronavirus could have been a uh, laboratory made, um, basically uh, insisted that it was uh, naturally made. And that became the, um, the mainstream position uh, until recently when, it, when, when things have shifted again. Uh, and, and, you know, what, one, one um, thesis around it is that, um, you know, the, the liberal scientific establishment did not in any way want to be seen as associated with uh, a tr Trump or any perspective, any position that supported Trumpism. So it was seen, it was, it was considered that to, to, to argue for a lab, you know, hypothesis to, you know, make it seem like an anti, you know, Chinese thing or something would be supporting Trump. So that was one reason the establishment totally lined up behind the, uh, the naturally occurring uh, virus. Uh, but I, I think it has much more to do with money and uh, power and also, you know, kind of, um, yeah, because if, if, if we lose, you know, if people lose faith in the scientific establishment, then, you know, they're not going to be wanting to fund uh, the biotechnology research and so on. And there's more questioning around what's happening there. Okay, the next question is, I have noticed in separate friend groups there is maybe one or two friends who are willing to look outside the box, but the others are following the narrative word for word. How is that? The unwillingness to question the MSM, et cetera. Yeah, well, I think as that uh, guest said before, I mean, it has to do with you know what Adam Curtis in his documentary calls hypernormalization. Uh, I mean, they've really mastered, you know, kind of like the, the media, I would say, you know, the, the mainstream media is basically a giant psyop that uh, indoctrinates people and keeps them, you know, in a limited bandwidth of, of, of thinking and understanding. And, um, you know, it is very oppressive and, and, you know, everywhere intrusive. So, you know, you know, people get sucked into it over time. It's almost like, you know, maybe they were independent thinkers when they were young, then they have kids, they have student debts, they have, you know, stuff to deal with. And, um, you know, suddenly they, they just fall into the into the slumber, you know, the, the trance of, of the mainstream and they and they get trapped there because it's so much easier just to go along with the mainstream. And humans are, you know, generally herd animals and uh, tend to tend to go along with with what surrounds them. You know. uh, can I can I chime in one thought on that um, yeah. is I recently heard it, there was a, a video of a WHO whistleblower you know, supposedly, right? I always question everything. And they were talking, she was talking about the test, right? The COVID test and about the fact that that could have just been done through saliva. So going up there and how, what a sensitive area that is. Yeah. You know, and that sounds maybe more in the conspiratorial range, but who knows, you know, could, could this test that was done massively on so many people, you know, cause some kind of, you know, mild damage or inflammation in the brain that would actually cause I, I don't know exactly what's right in that spot you know and i don't know if that's a little you know i've seen videos too like comparing it to egypt where they would go up there to kind of you know numb someone out but yeah man i mean i i agree with you i find it super fucking bizarre i mean i had to do one before leaving mexico and I was like, what the fuck? Like, you know, is the snot that's all the way up your fucking nose different yeah. than the snot that's like halfway down your nose? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, it almost does feel that it's like preparation for just, you know, you know, it's psychological intimidation, you know? Yeah. It, it's like gets you more and more ready for this idea of implants, you know, genetic manipulation, uh, indoctrination mechanisms. It's just they're, they're, they're just getting deeper and deeper in there.
you know? And I don't know, as I said, is it an right. organized intelligence? Is it an, is it gray aliens? Is it like, you know, is it, is it, you know, the Illuminati? Like, I have no idea, you know, it, or is it just self-organizing? You know, I, 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 I'm baffled, you know, or is it all of the above? Maybe, maybe it's, you know, that's part of the thing. It's like, it's uh, par paradoxically outside of what our, what our logic can fully understand. Kind of like with the masking, you know, like the illusion, right? By having all the people masked, also having this like, you know, this test that's really invasive. So it makes it seem like, oh my God, you know, yeah. it's a horribly invasive test, you know? Yeah. Totally. Cool. Um, yeah, thoughts on nanoparticulates being used for possible mind control. I mean, there you go into, you know, really, really intense speculations. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, as I said, you know, when I, when I looked into, when it's in this short book I wrote, Conspiranoia, all this Charles Lieber stuff, I mean, it is terrifying. I mean, he, he is talking about uh, nanotechnological implants that could be injectable, that uh, could con control the brainstem from inside. Uh, and this is not science fiction. I mean, he was the head of Harvard's chemistry department, and he was getting paid 50000 a month to have an illegal laboratory uh, in Wuhan. Um, so, and yes, I've looked into Operation uh, Monarch also. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, um, it's overwhelming, this shit. I don't know what you, you So yeah, do you find that people start to, when you begin talking about nanobite technology and how comprehensive that is, like they can respect an article in a mainstream medical publication talking about robots that are so tiny they can enter our veins to clear our veins out and that they can be maneuvered and controlled. But when you talk about other types of technology, even, even folks that are aware that China is doing all kinds of stuff with, with guns and pointing guns at people and reading emotions and, and having their score for, you know, behavior or whatever their social credit score is where they, they ding you if you have any friends that are dissidents or ask any questions or whatever. So even in the face of all that, you can ask people things, but they can't like add things up or it gets too complicated. I mean, do you feel like there's like a purposeful dumbing down of the population or something? So yeah, I mean, so once again, I mean, as I keep saying, I just don't know. Uh, I mean, it feels like a conspiratorial technocratic takeover uh, that has the, the 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 job of indoctrinating and maybe you know ultimately depopulating a lot of the world population. Uh, but you know, it may not be that. Um, you know, it it may just be that these are how these systems are self-organizing and you know, the extensions of a certain instrumental logic of, of science and technology. Um, but um, it Do does you, feel like an evil trap somehow. I have to say. So, so I mean, I I've, I've read all kinds of conspiracies from all kinds of people about about the world and and how strange the world is that we barely understand. Do you have any kind of uh, belief that there's a spiritual element to this, like dark forces at foot in the world, or? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I mean, that's a whole other thing that I've looked at in great depth. In fact, I recently also published a short book, a uh, short essay called The Occult Control System, looking at uh, these ideas that, you know, Jack Vallée, who was like a leading uh, ET and UFO researcher, talked about how maybe the whole UFO and extraterrestrial phenomenon as it manifested was something like a consciousness control system. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, it, it may be that there are, you know, beings who are, you know, slightly not in the same dimension as us, who are, you know, messing with us, you know, in certain respects. And I mean, there was this recently, there was an Israeli, 86-year-old uh, Israeli guy who was the former head of Israel Space Defense, who said that the U.S. and Israel were directly in touch with the Galactic Federation for decades. Uh, I think his name was Chaim, I can look it up. Uh, and that, um, they, that, that um, yeah, that they had a base together on Mars, actually. So, um, you know, so I don't know, is this, not happening? Is it happening? Um, I think it's the Chayim Eshet or something like that. If I slip it up. Um, yeah. So, you know, is he lying? Is that also, um, uh, you know, more smoke and mirrors? You know, I don't know. So when we talk about um, the psychedelic community, well, we're usually historically talking about the rebels and the trouble, the troublemakers and the anti-Vietnam Vietnam War protesters and people that care about peace and love and 
and community and um, and fighting the man and fighting and fighting or asking questions of the of a government that hasn't historically served anyone. So in this context where people have uh, like a short term memory loss or something or long term memory loss and they've forgotten the history of the entire U.S. government or, or what have you. And all of a sudden they're they're trusting big pharma or big business. What do you do? Uh, how do you how do you kind of uh, make peace with that? Because is it is it like the question? It was why do people in the psychedelic community who care so much about asking questions, like not trusting the government that has historically loved to fuck us all over, all of a sudden they are the biggest normies? Is it the capitalism of the psychedelic culture? So, what what do you make of that? Of the psychedelic community just kind of buying in, buying into this or not asking questions? Uh. Yeah, I mean, well, that's interesting. I mean, um, I, I, you know, I've had a little bit of a, you know, I haven't been as, I haven't been as, as connected to the psychedelic community over the last couple of years. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously there's been an integration of, of psychedelics into capitalism, and what preceded that was was kind of a, um, kind of a, you know, in a, in a way a normalization of the psychedelic experience so that it fit into the scientific, um, you know, worldview. Uh, so what, what, what that's meant is, a, is you know, a focus, you know, whether through MAPS or the Horizon Conference in, in New York, on simply the, the medical and therapeutic uh, benefits of psychedelics, I ignoring uh, a lot of the other aspects of the psychedelic experience. Um, the more, you know, sometimes uh, transcendent, you know, paranormal experiences and so on. Um, so it's like, it's like the, 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 the whole psychedelic realm has been kind of like, shaped and sculpted, re-sculpted to fit in, you know, with, with more of a mainstream uh, worldview. And now there's like, you know, you know, gain to be had, you know, there's careers to be had, you know. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's just this, um, something about this situation right now is really proving to be an extremely dichotomous one. Uh, and um, it's, it's, it's super interesting and confusing and, um, yeah, um, I, I don't know exactly why it's like that. Why, why, they, why these uh, the psychedelic community have become super normative like that? Well, and I had today even from from doing this, there, you know, like six people left, you know, the society, and they're you know comments like, I don't believe in you know, I don't like conspiracy theorists, yeah. and anti vaxxers and when this all started from the beginning, I sent out an email, you know, question going on, um, and. I mean, the amount of outrage and, you know, the response back of, you know, just cancel culture, right? Like, there was no, there was no room for, which I found really odd. I think I became a person running the psychedelic society, <laughs> you know, by questioning, you know, the oh. it's pretty surprising to me, but, you know, seeing it move into the realization of the dream. I think is part of the effect of that. I love everything you have to say, but sometimes your voice drops out, which is unfortunate. Maybe move a little closer. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I totally, I totally hear you. I mean, um, um, the, 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 the sort of minds in the, the U.S. mentality has uh, closed itself down in a very strange way. And this whole identity politics, cancel culture uh, thing is very unhealthy. Um, it's 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 not it's not helping the situation. It's 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 not leading to a, a, a liberated society, a more liberated society. Well, it's um, like the, to me, it's the opposite of psychedelic. Part of psychedelic is like recognizing, you know, our shared our shared humanity. You know, in these experiences, where to me this is all so counter the psychedelic. You know, is that better for sound? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Yeah, I mean. I'm, yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, and, you know, but then also it's like, I mean, I think part of the problem we have with psychedelics is, I mean, originally they were used as initiatory tools in indigenous societies. And initiation is not just taking a psychedelic. It's also then having elders and a context and a mythology, a, sh a shared understanding of the world. Um, you know, it, it, we don't have that. So in a way, you know, with, with, with the, the sort of domination, you know, of maps, I mean, I love maps, you know, and, you know, the, the scientific perspective it's kind of a closed down the psychedelic paradigm. Um, and we almost need like a re-revolution, you know, within the psychedelic movement 
uh, to embrace, you know, the, the, the Terrence McKenna-ish uh, weirdness of it all again. Yeah, so, oh, for sure. Um, so somebody, I saw a few other interesting questions. Um, somebody asked, what are some spiritual practices you employ to stay grounded? Do you incorporate any plant medicine into that? Uh, so, I, you know, I, I really haven't been doing much plant medicine, a little bit of low-dose mushrooms, but I've actually been, you know, meditating uh, a lot, which is new for me. Uh, and really uh, appreciating it and actually find, you know, maybe it's all the, the, the pre-work in shamanism and psychedelics, but I, I very quickly can move into kind of, a, you know, euphoric kind of no mind states um, that, you know, help me to stay calm and, and, and feel, you know, kind of, you know, a little bit not attached. Um, and so somebody asked, do you find there's greater stress in the world, even if you carve out your own separate community away from the chaos, there's no way to get away from the depression of the thing. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I, I've definitely um, struggled over the last years with a sense of uh, doom and gloom. Uh, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, I mean, in a way, this whole COVID thing and even maybe what's happening with technocracy and, and the World Economic Forum and, and these governments and their efforts to control humanity and, and the earth, it's like maybe small potatoes compared to what's about to hit us uh, ecologically. Um, cause I, 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 you know, from, I mean, I even read Bill Gates's like climate, climate change, uh, you know, new book, you know, they, you know, they don't have any answers for, uh, the deeper things that, 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 that are, that are going on, you know, which includes the uh, methane, which is erupting, you know, from the Arctic, uh, permafrost and, um, you know, the uh, level of extinction of species and, um, you know, the deforestation from fires, which then leads to more CO2 in the atmosphere while we've got less carbon sinks. So, you know, all, all this stuff is accelerating uh, very, very rapidly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, we're just in a very existential situation, actually. And, uh, you know, the, the em embrace of that, you know, in itself can be like a shamanic act. Um, like there's, there's not a normal that we're going to go back to. And, um, you know, it's, it's going to get more and more, you know, freaky, um, you know, in, in different degrees, I think, from here on out. Um, and, you know, being able to accept that and move into it in itself is almost like, yeah, like a shamanic act or, or initiatory psychedelic act. Um, well, I feel like in a, in a lot of ways, it's like we're living in like the inversion, you know, like everything is being inverted. And, and through that pro process of like witnessing that, I think it's what you're talking about, like the that shamanic process of seeing kind of being that non non objective or objective observer of non duality. Yeah, you know, seeing this nature of everything as its opposite, you know, and I think exactly. we're in a heightened time of that. Yeah, very good. Uh, okay, hold on a second. Leo Russell again, Leo, if also if you want to jump in and actually talk, oh, that's you, Leo, your questions. Uh, was I surprised that you were blocked and censored on Facebook? Uh, um, I was a little surprised that I'd never gotten blocked or, or censored from them before. And, and actually the, the piece, which I, I put at the beginning of the chat, but I'll hit, up, hit it up again, uh, really didn't say like anything uh, that I felt uh, was so exact about, um, maybe you have to scroll up, but I mean, I was, I was talking about, um, I mean, you know, in terms of the uh, normativization, the fact that everybody is trusting, um, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, and essentially we know that, you know, we can look at the last, you know, 60 years, or whatever, of publicly traded corporations, you know, cigarette companies, and uh, you know how they hid the danger of tobacco, you know, fossil fuel companies, how they, um, you know, kind of spend billions of dollars on dis disinformation, so that we wouldn't realize that climate change was the disaster that it's turning out to be. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, you know, have had many scandals, as with Vioxx uh, uh, and other drugs, thalidomide and so on. You know, so why, 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 why would we take these, um, suddenly take these, these companies at face value and say like, oh, what they're now doing is, you know, going to be good for everybody. Whereas actually, these same companies are going to benefit if people have long-term negative consequences, even if they don't know exactly what those consequences are yet, they're, they're, they're gonna know that they're gonna be the ones who are supplying the drugs when people's immune systems are compromised, they develop heart problems or blood clotting problems. I mean, I think maybe I have some personal sensitivity to this because when I was born in the mid sixties, my mother was told that a uh, formula, you know, was better than, than breast milk. And she was working, she didn't really wanna, you know, deal with breastfeeding, so I never got breastfed. And then later on, of course, they found out that, you know, formula was much worse and, 
you know, I ended up getting, you know, asthma and allergies and, and stuff like that. And, you know, maybe it, who knows it was exactly, you know, correlated with that, but, you know, it could have been. So, yeah. So, 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 you know, a lot of times science is very, very, com you know, very, very confident uh, that uh, it, it's, it's progressing us. And then we learn later that it's actually, you know, taking us in a, in a much more negative direction. Um, let's see. Um, so, uh, so Daniel, I'm happy to read this question, but it has to do with um, you had mentioned <laughs> it's going to get more and more freaky. And I've had multiple people that are psychics and what have you tell me like things like shit's going to go down. Like people are there with their iPhone 12 or whatever, and they don't even realize like we are leaving an iPhone world, according to some of these people. Like we are uh, like we are just going to see more and more. Um, whether it's a nefarious interests that are affecting things and trying to cull the population or what have you, like the, the idea that people are going to be dealing with a drastically different landscape. Let's say in two years, right now we've got the cost of inflation. We've got someone on the call right now who's talking about the cost of lumber going up like a hundredfold or something. Like inflation, because we've, we've put so much money into the, we've printed so much money during COVID, um, is, is going to cause so much devastation. Right now in Seattle, we have the third largest uh, population of homelessness, uh, of homelessness population here. And we have 300 businesses that have gone out of business in downtown Seattle. Um, I have a friend that works in government. She um, runs the Soho Business District. And she mentioned that the pot of money that goes towards those homeless people is generated by those businesses that the, that we've just lost 300 in the central corridor of downtown Seattle. So what people don't realize is when the when the rent moratorium ends, like we're fucked. Like I don't think people realize. Like I've spoken to friends, the police are no longer responding to uh, crimes like shoplifting and crimes like burglary and things like that. Um, even in quote nice neighborhoods. So what happens when the police aren't there and your neighbor um, gets hungry and wants to steal your food and maybe we're close to that point? Um, because my question earlier had been about the generalized depression. Let's get, let's say that you can escape my um, uh, Daniel to Tulum and you can get out of, uh, that was one of the questions was why, why did you move to Mexico? But maybe maybe like I've gone to Greece since this has all begun, you know, I've gone to Mexico since this has all begun. And I think part of me wants to have the experience of, I just want to return to normal. I just want to get away from this. But what if you can't escape from this? And what if it's everywhere, you know, and that depression of there's like a collective depression that happens. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can talk about both of those questions. Yeah, I mean, well, Tulum is a kind of a funny escape. I mean, I ended up down here. I, I was with an Austrian uh, girlfriend uh, for lockdown. And then I, I, my visa, European visa, ran out. She couldn't come to the US. So Mexico was one of the only places we could come. And I had friends who had a hotel on the beach here. And it was, and it was still quarantined. So we, they allowed us to stay there for very cheap. Um, and then I was here, and it was beautiful. And then we broke up. But I stayed here because it was, made more sense for me than going back to New York at that point. Um, but Tulum is, a, is also a total mess. I mean, it's the, the, the oceans are often cho choked with this sort of seaweed that seems to be coming from, you know, like Brazil and the septic systems here. The uh, snow, snow days are being poisoned. Um, the uh, cartels are moving in and, and shooting each other in the streets. Um, the tourists are, you know, a lot of tourists are like out of their minds, just taking drugs. And it's like sort of Babylon zombie land. Um, so yeah, so, I mean, but I mean, I, I do think that Mexico has, um, more freedom than the U S, um, in many ways that I'm actually really appreciating, um, you know, even down to little things where you can like smoke at an outdoor restaurant if you want to, or, you know, not wear a seatbelt in a car. I mean, I feel like, you know, and also laws are kind of fungible, you know, corruption is, is localized and in some ways it actually uh, feels more human. Um, and, and, and it feels a little bit more soulful. Uh, it feels like a lot of the U.S. has kind of lost some kind of uh, intrinsic quality of soul um, that I still feel here more. So I, I, I may end up, you know, staying in Mexico but moving to a different place in Mexico. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn enough Spanish um, to, 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 to be functional here. Um, uh, what was your other question? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, we, don't, we never know uh, how soon things are going to come apart. I mean, I wrote the 2012 book. 
So back in 2010, you know, we thought things were maybe going to come apart soon. The, the, the time when things are going to come apart always seems to get, you know, pushed forward. Um, and, you know, we never know how much more slack is in the system. Um, you know, you probably could figure it out, you know, if, if you had a bunch of sophisticated analysts who were looking at things like, um, you know, what is this, you know, ongoing climate disruption going to do to agriculture yields, for instance, you know, you know, if you have 120 degree days in, you know, June and July, does that fry like all of the agricultural produce, you know, in, in a whole region? Um, or if you have a mega drought, you know, that lasts for six months and, you know, and, and on the most, you know, negative you know, potential of the conspiracy matrix, you know, it, it may be that, you know, certain factions within, you know, high level, you know, military intelligence have done all this math and they may actually think that, um, but I don't know that this is the case and I don't know why, even, you know, but, you know, they might think at a certain point that a kind of, uh, you know, virus type of population is more humane than letting people, you know, enter a zone of, of chaos and starvation. Um, you know, it's not out of the question that there are people who are, who are thinking like that, you know. Um, so, you know, what would be some things to do in this scenario? I mean, I, 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 you know, I can give advice, but I haven't taken it myself, although I have friends who are doing it. And that would be to, you know, build communities where you had, you know, the capacity to create some of your own food and access to your own, you know, water and energy, um, you know, with, with networks, you know, neighborhood networks, community networks, where, where you were actually were building you know, lo local connectivity, um, you know, and, you know, and then also just recognizing that this is like um, something that humanity is going through and may maybe, maybe it's an extinction level event we're moving towards or um, a type of transformation that uh, brings about, you know, something unknown, like a metamorphosis in, in human consciousness or something like that. Um, so, yeah. The next question was lumber in Washington has quadrupled this year. The supply chain is dwindling. Homes are being gobbled up by BlackRock and the Fed is printing money hand over fist. Can you speak to these issues and the possible agenda at hand? Yeah. So, Don, I mean, as I keep saying, I mean, I, you know, I toggle around thinking that this is all, you know, there, there's a level of which is just could just be chaotic and how a system works, you know, when, when it's pushed in this way. You know, um, and, and, you know, where, where the, you know, agenda is, I mean, um, so, yeah, you know, it, you know, but everything you point towards, you know, it, it indicates that the whole thing is going kind of, you know, out of control. And, um, um, yeah, that seems to be what's happening. <laughs> um, you know, I, I mean, um, uh, we, you know, we definitely have known for a long time that um, we were, you know, kind of um, uh, out of balance, you know, getting deep, more and more out of balance um, in terms of, you know, what the Earth's, you know, kind of resources would allow for us. Um, and, um, yeah, so. Yeah. One, one question I have is when you look at energy, like emotional energy or spiritual energy, there had been a couple of talks about trying to talk to folks about like, hey, you know, your government lied about X, Y, and Z. You might want to understand that your government doesn't always like want good things for you, um, but that you can't seem to get people to accept that, that their government may not want good things for them. Because um, you had mentioned the censorship of what's happening in England as far as the protests and so forth. So if, if your government's trying to deceive you and, and keep information from you, that, that doesn't feel like a, like a loving, benevolent parent. Um, so just wondering if you, if you have any thoughts on, on you know, being able to, to recognize some people just don't want to, um, who, you know, they don't want to question. Yeah. Okay. One of the questions was, uh, I subscribed to Mike Adams on Bright Brightian, and he has lots of info on what um, is happening and the projections, lots of talk about breakdown of supply chains and actual famine. We need to grow our own food and not rely on grocery stores, think farmer markets and neighborhood gardens. So that's what you had spoken about. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, you know we're, we're in a society that you know, tends to make people totally dependent 
And, um, you know, to the extent that you can take back some of your self-sufficiency, you know, that, that, that could be beneficial. But, yeah, it's just very hard. I can't, I, I can't put a time frame on anything. I'm not a prognosticator in that sense. Um, yeah. But, but uh, you said that living in Mexico still feels a little bit more soulful. And that, that sense of soul, you said, had kind of, for you, in your observation, has kind of left the, the you know, United States. Uh, yeah, I mean... Um, um, I think maybe I just needed a break from the United States. I mean, there's you know lots of beauty in the United States. Of course, too. of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. This says, do you know about chlorine dioxide? Dioxide is a possible therapeutic treatment for COVID. People have been using it safely for over 20 years to treat disease. Within the last uh, year, hundreds of MSM hit pieces have been published calling yeah. it toxic bleach. Uh, I mean, I, I took it once. I have some in my fridge. Uh, it definitely feels like you're you know basically taking disinfectant uh it doesn't feel very healthy um but um you know there is um yeah for you know there's some countries it's it's like a low rent way of dealing with the virus i, I don't know what the actual studies the actual figures are but i know there are people here who swear by it uh, I, can Michael. Read, I, can, I, can, I can read the next one yeah uh, something important that I've come across that we are part of nature, not separate from it. Ancient cultures talk about rites of passage for during a new phase in life. Not everyone survives that passage. Earth is going through its own rites of passage, just as humans are. We are still working through an adolescent phase and may not be mature enough to make it. Yeah, Miguel, I mean, that's something that's like one of the big themes of my, uh, my work, you know, both in Breaking Open the Head in 2012. Um, yeah. Uh, in your opinion, do you see any links between COVID and percent G? I don't know what percent G is. What are your opinions on that theory? Uh, anybody know what percent G is? I think uh, it's five, five G, I imagine. Oh, five G. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, I haven't really followed the five G uh, thing so deeply. Uh, I mean, um, um, I, I, it, it feels like, you know, we, it's not like that we need it to have, you know, Netflix and HBO screen, stream faster. So, you know, what is it for? I mean, it's, it's obviously for this next level of, of, you know, technocratic imposition, transhumanism, uh, robotics, you know, so um, and I, I don't know about um, its impact on, 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 you know, the human EMF system. I, I know some of my friends think that it's really terrible. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not really, you know, I don't, I don't feel that uh, prepared to, to discuss that or comment on it. You know. um, maybe just uh, one more comment or question if somebody wants to jump in and ask something. Um, there was a question about the actual number of vaccination injuries and deaths. I think the idea was yeah. whether it's been. Yeah, Leo, I mean, I kind of answered that. I mean, I looked at this guy, Alex Berenson. He's very active on Twitter. He's published some interesting uh, he wrote a four-part uh, book series um, on COVID. Um, you know, I, and my anecdotal sense awesome. is overwhelming that people are, are dropping, um, you know, soon after taking the vaccines. And unlike the coronavirus, where basically anybody who, who broke, who had coronavirus or had it, you know, recently was being chalked up as a coronavirus death statistic. With the vaccine, it seems to be the opposite, that if somebody, like apparently... Um, uh, the friend I spoke to today said that, you know, that her, I think it was her father of her cousin or something was like 60 year old old guy, you know, got the vaccine and two days later he started throwing up and then died. Uh, and uh, the hospital said it was food poisoning that killed him, you know. So, um, so, you know, unlike the virus where, you know, any opportunity to chalk up a death to the COVID was, was being chalked up, it seems like the opposite when it comes to the vaccine. So it just feels that the medical establishment is exerting a lot of um, manipulative energy to, um, you know, make, make the vaccine paradigm, you know, the only game in town. And, um, you know, there, there's obviously a lot of power, very, very powerful vested interests. And, you know, and as I said, you know, it's $26 billion for Pfizer alone. Um, you know, if they get to do booster shots every six months or every, every time there's a new fucking variant, you know, that's another $26 billion for them every time. Plus, if it actually degrades people's biological systems and they get blood clots, heart problems, other weird diseases, that's all great for the pharmaceutical companies because they're, they're going to be the ones who are making the drugs to try to, you know, keep people functional, you know. 
Uh, somebody asked about uh, Charles Lieber. Charles Lieber? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely worth uh, looking him up. Um, he, was in, he was caught by the CIA because he was running, even though he was the chair of Harvard's chemistry department, which you think would be a, a big enough job uh, that had mil millions of dollars of funding attached to it, he also was running a secret uh, lab in Wuhan uh, working on the uh, nanotechnological project of Neurolace. Uh, and, and also, by the way, in the, in the last year before the, um, you know, the Wuhan lab leak, um, um, you know, there were a number of um, virologists, Chinese virologists, who've been stealing samples of different, um, you know, toxic viruses from Canada and other, and other institutions. Some of them got caught doing that. So, you know, Ch China is clearly engaged in a very aggressive uh, program to, um, you know, utilize uh, biowarfare. That, that's what it looks like to me. Um, and in Conspiranoia, I had some uh, good article uh, references about it. I'll see if I can find one. Um, I have a question. Do you, do you feel like your career in any way or your platform has been attacked because you've chosen to question some of these things or, or report on them or ask more questions? Obviously, the Facebook. Um, I mean, I, I have a very bizarre career anyway. I mean, I mean, in a way, like, um, yeah, it's, I, I don't really know how to answer that at this point. Okay. I mean, um, you know, I, I basically, I had a, you know, bestseller, you know, back like 12 years ago with the 2012 book, but then unfortunately it took me a very long time to get out my next book, which was How Soon Is Now? And, you know, I thought that was going to be a big book, but, but somehow it just missed um, the target. Uh, I still really think it's worth reading, but uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't get the type of pickup that I hoped. Yep. Um, so I think we're running out of time, but did you want to say more about uh, anything in particular or were there any last questions that people are just dying to ask Daniel? Uh, I was trying to find this. Uh, oh yeah, weaponizing biotech. Here's the article. You'd have to link it up, um, but it's worth doing it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, have you looked into the Denver airport and the murals depicting NWO? Uh, yes, I remember looking into it, um, but, um, you know, whatever at this point. Um, uh, okay, guess I highly recommend the Dark Horse podcast. It comes with Brett Weinstein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he has um, been surprisingly... Uh, authentic about uh, covering how weird this whole situation is. Um, he's probably you know one of the most mainstream commentators to uh, take a stab at it. Um, but anyway, yeah. Well, listen. It was really I really appreciated actually the dialogue, and I'm I'm happy that people you know are are up for this. And I'll give you my email. Feel free to stay in touch. Please follow my um, newsletter. I'm teaching a writing seminar this summer. If anybody wants to do some writing. Um, and um, yeah, I'm happy to come back and chat more. I thought it was, I thought it, was um, it was a good chat. Yeah, we we really uh, loved and appreciated having the opportunity to do this today. So thank you so yeah. much, Danny. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Any follow up? I'd be happy to hear. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Ciao, ciao. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate it. That was great.